What determined a lot of the things about Kes and the way it looks begins with the central image of the bird which flies free and the boy who is trapped. That is clearly what connects to people. In a world where Hollywood's high-budget superhero movies and epic fantasies attract huge audiences and eye-watering profits, Ken Loach stands apart. His relatively understated films authentically depict everyday life and its often brutal social context. In doing so, he's able to give a voice to the voiceless, start important conversations and achieve a powerful social impact. Everything he's done, everything, without exception, has had a message and has either caused a furore or there's, there's been debates about it and one thing and another, Cathy come up, all, everything he does is meaningful and I think, I think that's a wonderful testament to him. In a career spanning more than half a century, Loach has achieved both prestigious awards and much needed social change. But how has he been able to achieve both cinematic excellence and scathing social criticism? In this video, I want to explore Loach's enduring principles that have allowed him to make films that are both beautiful and hard-hitting. Well, f f films can be as, should be as broad as a library. You know, it should have everything. It should every kind of story and situation we can imagine, whether it's funny, whether it's sad, whether it's tragedy, whether it's comedy, um, whether it's documentary, whether it takes us to from different places, or whether it reflects the world we know. It should be everything. Um, and I think reflecting the world we know it can make beautiful cinema because um, it can celebrate who we are, it can laugh with us, it can cry with us, it can, it can learn about our deepest feelings and what it is to be human. And that, you find that in, every, in the everyday. At first glance, the average Ken Loach film isn't all that exciting. If I read you a premise such as a man becomes a delivery driver to get out of debt, you wouldn't exactly jump at the prospect. This is because each film is the antithesis of a typical Hollywood movie. There are no A-list celebrities, no big name producers, and no sensationalized trailers. Instead, Loach insists on using new, inexperienced actors to tell everyday stories about ordinary people. This approach to filmmaking has its roots in Loach's early influences. Unlike many directors, he was never entranced by American cinema. Instead, he found inspiration in Europe among the Italian neorealists. I was never entranced by American cinema, particularly. Um, and then when we were at the BBC and I started looking at films, the, obviously the big influence for everyone uh, from my generation were, were the Italian neorealists. And, and the idea that cinema didn't have to be about film stars was the was the um, the big thing that said, and that you could take the camera into the streets and mm. just seeing them as a, mm. as when I was young, it said cinema can be about real life. We must get that bicycle, you hear? I must get it to earn some money, or else we won't eat. Perhaps the most iconic film to come out of this genre, and one that heavily influenced Loach, is Vittorio De Sica's Bicycle Thieves. Set in Rome, the film follows a poor father who is desperately trying to provide for his young family. It offers a unique and authentic portrayal of the poverty and unemployment endemic within post-war Roman society. In this harsh context, ordinary individuals, such as the film's protagonist, are effectively powerless. In the words of a New York Times reviewer, it is the isolation and loneliness of the little man in this complex social world. Now, compared to Seeker's version of Rome to the one provided by Hollywood around the same time, William Wyler's Roman Holiday. Here, a crown princess meets a reporter who takes her on a whistle-stop tour of the city. Driving around in a Vespa, the characters, played by A-list film stars Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn, 
go to various iconic landmarks such as the Spanish Steps, the Mouth of Truth and the Colosseum. The film paints a romanticised vision of post-war Rome, where money is no object and everything is possible. The ordinary man, desperately trying to make ends meet, is nowhere to be seen. Whilst there is nothing wrong with Wyler's approach, it may cause some misunderstandings. Audiences that only see Hollywood's perspective on the world, where every character is exceptional and the person playing them is a film star, may forget that genuine social problems exist. Meanwhile, the neorealist showed that film could be used to highlight social problems and not just gloss over them. Like his neorealistic influences, Ken Loach is just as concerned with individual characters as the social context that governs their lives. I mean, we've always felt it's very important that that the that fiction is is driven by by the characters and their um, you know what compels them to act in a certain way. What do you think, lad? That's no bad. Home sweet home. Looks all right outside, doesn't it? Boot it, lad. Boot it. They relate to the, the context they're in. They're formed by it, you know, that's in a way you can't but be that. Um, it's kind of truism, you know, but, but one which I think sometimes fiction or films ignore. Um, because characters are seen somewhere in a vacuum, you know. Um, whereas I think it's absolutely interrelated to the economic circumstances you live in, whether you're part of a society which from which you're alienated or whether you're part of it, a contributing part of it. Whilst the characters in each film aren't real, the world they inhabit certainly is. It is through this lens that Loach can deliver a scathing social criticism, despite ultimately creating a work of fiction. One of Loach's first films, Kathy Come Home, initially seems like your typical Hollywood romance. It follows a young woman called Kathy as she hitchhikes to the city finds work and falls in love with Reg, the man of her dreams. Yet the budding romance soon takes a turn for the worse. Kathy becomes pregnant and Reg is injured at work, depriving the couple of any income and beginning a descent into poverty and then homelessness. Instead of your usual romantic narrative that would blame a relationship breakdown on an individual problem such as an affair, Loach gives us a sobering reminder that a relationship can break down through factors that are beyond individual control. In this case, their plight is caused by housing policies that prevent struggling families from finding a home where they can all live together. Towards the end of the film, Kathy and her children are literally forced to separate from Reg as no men are allowed in the homeless shelter. Oh, I see. You're newcomers, are you? Well, no men beyond the lodge. I'm afraid you'll have to get out and say goodbye to your wife now. Here we see the social structure of housing policy is perhaps the most influential protagonist in the film. And this was not lost on the audience. I think there's been enormous confusion in the public mind as to whether this is in fact fact or fiction. I mean, what is there to prevent you next time when you want to make your point a little more strongly to introduce fictional statistics as well. But I thought it was a brilliant piece of uh, propaganda of a highly charged emotional kind. The, the script was written, there were 60 odd actors in it. Um, the fact that Ken Loach is such a good director that the actors often don't look like actors is, is hardly my fault. The film's broadcast was met with a public outcry, the formation of the homeless charity crisis and the changing of the rules so that homeless fathers could stay with their wives and children in hostels. Yet Loach's campaigning didn't stop there. Exactly 50 years after the broadcast of Kathy Come Home, Loach released I, Daniel Blake, an eerily similar film that dealt with the structural causes of poverty. This time, Loach took aim at the Department of Work and Pensions and its cruel record of depriving disabled individuals their much needed living costs. Instead of blaming the individual, as so many have, the film shined a light on the failures of an uncaring welfare state. It showed how the insidious idea of the undeserving poor was used to inflict more misery on those who had fallen on hard times through no fault of their own. 
Again, the most influential protagonist in this film was not Daniel Blake, but the system that failed him. Whenever a film like I, Daniel Blake is used in a political context, you'll often hear arguments like this one. I mean, Ken has been working for 50 years as a social commentator, as a, one of our great directors. I have huge respect for his work. But it is creative. I don't think it's an accurate... I mean, it's not uh, true, is that what you're well, saying? Well, I think elements of it are true. But as he said, he's telling a story. There's a place for social commentary. There's a place for, um, you know, from Dickens right through Ken's work to now. There's lots of uh, place for social commentary, but I don't think it's actually reflecting a broader reality. Which is fair enough. However, these stories are not created in a vacuum. Each film is heavily researched to the point that it is effectively an ethnographic study. It's applying to hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and uh, if, if you uh, go around the country, you'll find the food banks in every city. Uh, you'll find people getting sanctions all the time. I think it's short, it was a year, the year before last, a million sanctions. And that means people's lives are thrown in chaos. Um, we found story after story after story. We could have said this, said this film in any city, uh, any corner of the, of the country. So I think this is very typical of what's happening. Therefore, it is no surprise that these stories often mirror reality. In my analysis of I, Daniel Blake, I recounted the tragic, real-life story of Stephen Smith, an individual who had come up against the same issues highlighted in the film and sadly died as a result. Yet it's not only Ken Loach's stories that are grounded in reality. His whole approach as a director brings honesty and respect to incredibly difficult subjects. Instead of forcing his own style and perspective on his subject matter, he prefers to use only the most appropriate way of telling his stories. The thing about style, I think, is that, um, you know, it's the old adage that style reflects content. It isn't something stuck on you know, like a, a new suit. I mean, it should, I mean, it must actually come from what are we trying to express and how can we best express it? This commitment to authenticity flows through to every facet of his films. For example, they are almost exclusively shot on location. Riff Raff, a film that documents the irony of a homeless construction worker, was filmed on a real building site instead of an artificial set. You actually forget you're in a movie altogether. And what was, what was really good for me about Riff Raff is it was a, a real building site and the production team and everyone and all of the, the real building workers and ourselves, we all ate in the same little room on the, the same sort of makeshift tables and, and the office, the, the production office was actually a site hut. And, and, they, and it's really, it was just like a building site and that was it. Authenticity is also central to the process of choosing actors and actresses. Whilst it might seem that Loach's rejection of well-known celebrity names means that he sets a low bar, the reality is quite the opposite. Finding the right person is crucial because you've got to find someone who, who can connect to the part, but can also make the audience believe in them and make the audience care about them uh, and do it in a quite unselfconscious way so that they're not, they're not consciously working out, you know, like most acting where I think you see the wheels going round. At the same time, Loach achieves realistic and genuine acting by filming chronologically and encouraging improvisation. In a way, it takes the responsibility away from the actors. Mm. They don't spend six weeks thinking, my God, I've got to be surprised. My God, I've got to break down into tears. Mm. My God, how am I going to do this? It, it's, if they are true mm. in their responses, and that's what you test in the auditioning process, this commitment to realism means that his films must be taken seriously. They cannot be dismissed as purely fictional because the stories they are based off are real life accounts. Equally, Loach's understated style and commitment to authentic acting ensures that each depiction fairly reflects its source material. Of course, some may argue that keeping things realistic doesn't make for good cinema, but this is where many, including Loach, would disagree. Realistic movies allow the audience to see themselves on screen. I think it's that way you get a feeling of solidarity, really. And one thing you want from the audience is a feeling of, they're me, I'm them, you know. I, that's, we're, we have a collective responsibility. It's, we're in the same world, you know. Um, and I think, 
I think a problem with sort of a number of films is that just as people are alienated from the society they're living in, the characters in the film are alienated from the audience. And I think that's a pity. And it's to do with it's to do with the kind of writing, it's to do with the kind of shooting which puts people at arm's length. You know. If you say how the world is, that should be enough. Just the sense of simple connection between people. Just being. Ken Loach is a director in a league of his own. For more than half a century, he has carried the torch for social realism, a genre that has produced some of the most powerful and important cinema of our times. If you're interested in hearing more about social realism, such as the work of Shane Meadows or Mike Lee, let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please do like and subscribe, it really helps the channel out.